Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week. Starship's fourth flight is closing in at an absolutely bonkers pace, but why did SpaceX just demolish their launch pad at Pad 39A? Meanwhile in Kazakhstan, the Expedition 70 Soyuz capsule landed successfully after a lengthy stay at the International Space Station, SpaceX conducted a massive four orbital launches with its Falcon rocket, and China made a single space outing on Tuesday. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. This is Booster 11, the super heavy vehicle that'll carry Starship to space on its fourth orbital flight test. And here, you can see it performing a static fire test at the launch pad, which took place last Saturday and by all measures was a complete success. And there are now no more tests that this vehicle needs to undergo before launch, aside from full stack wet dress rehearsal. The Flight 4 Starship, Ship 29, has also passed all of its pre-full stack tests. Having performed its own full duration static fire test at the static fire pad, so not a lot is left to go before Flight 4. Ideally, we're looking at a launch date as early as next month, so get excited for that. Right now though, after completion of its static fire, Booster 11 has now been lifted off the launch pad and is en route back to Mega Bay 1 for final checkouts, which, among other things, will include the installation of its hot staging ring, which as you can see in this amazing footage from Starship Gazer, uh, was missing during the static fire test. But with all that, most of the biggest Starship news of the past week wasn't stuff that SpaceX actively did, but stuff it plans to do. Founder and owner Elon Musk gave an update speech about the future of the Starship program and how things were going on behind closed doors. He started off talking about his hopes for Flight 4, which included this cool shot of Flights 1 through 3 displayed side by side, giving a great demonstration of how the thrust to weight ratio has increased with each subsequent launch. Furthermore, he expressed his hope that Flight 4 will see the Starship survive the high heat phase of re-entry and smash into the ocean at a controlled, predetermined determined location, and that the booster will land at a simulated tower location in the ocean. So basically meaning it'll soft land in the sea, but at a pre-selected spot as a test of how reasonable a tower catch will be with the current level of the booster's landing accuracy. If it succeeds, Elon then dropped this bombshell that if it works for flight Five, SpaceX will attempt to have the booster try and fly back to Boca Chica and land at the tower. He did then add that this was probably a slightly optimistic timeline, but noted that he hoped for a super heavy tower landing to happen at least at some point this year, with around an 80 to 90% chance of actually happening. Along with this, we got this insane animation. Now, I don't know about you, but the angle of approach for the booster looks, well, insane. I guess we all assumed it would come down more or less directly vertically onto the clamps, rather than having this very sideways looking trajectory. Maybe it's easier to abort the landing if the trajectory is off coming in like this. I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this one though. Continuing on, Elon then stated what I think is obvious to most. Recovery and reuse of the Starship upper stage will present a significantly greater challenge than recovery of the Super Heavy. Not just because of the fact that the Starship is re-entering from orbit, but also bear in mind that Super Heavy recovery is very, very similar to Falcon 9 first stage recovery, which for SpaceX, as you'll know if you watch these videos, is more or less a solved problem. It shouldn't take too much additional learning to build upon the data from SpaceX's Falcon 9 first stage recovery program, one would think anyway. <laughs> so before SpaceX really start actually attempting to have the ship land itself SN15 style, they will want to have it crash into the ocean at a predetermined spot to ensure it can accurately maneuver its way down to Earth before they attempt a landing back at the launch site, particularly because they don't want to go raining debris across the United States in the event of loss of vehicle. So while SpaceX is hopeful for super heavy tower catch this year, the main objective for the Starship upper stage this year is controlled water landing only, with tower catch attempt likely to occur next year or the year after. Elon then also talked about the desire to have two Mechazillas, or you know, launch towers at both Boca Chica and Cape Canaveral. Interestingly, in this render, the arms of the catch system are the same length, whereas we know that the latest catch arm design is shorter than what we've seen at Boca Chica, thanks to flyover pictures of Roberts Road from photographers like Greg Scott. Maybe I'm just overthinking this one though. <laughs> Speaking of the cape though, NASA Spaceflight's livestream of Pad 39A captured the moment where workers felled the final remaining orbital launch bound leg at the Starship pad. Here's a close-up of the legs at Boca Chica, captured before the launch mount itself was installed 
installed for a better idea of what these look like. We don't know why SpaceX demolished the legs, but it's probably because they've made big improvements to its design in surviving Starship launches, given the data from Flight 1, 2 and 3 at Boca Chica, and that it'll be rebuilt in a much more resilient construction. Elon then discussed the production goals for SpaceX this year, namely six additional Super Heavy boosters and six additional Starships. And what will power these? Well, so far, everything you see at Boca Chica is powered by Raptor 2. Well, except Ship 20, that's Raptor 1, but that's not going to fly, so we'll just discount that. But in the presentation, we got a glimpse of a render of the upcoming Raptor 3. Obviously, the jump from Raptor 1 to Raptor 2 was huge, with the engine looking much cleaner and simpler. But I feel like we are seeing a jump of equal magnitude in reduction of complexity, moving from Raptor 2 to Raptor 3. You can also see from the numbers there that it's a lot more powerful. 280 tons of thrust versus Raptor 2's 230 at sea level. We also got a first first look at what the version 2 Starship will look like. V2 is almost certainly where Raptor 3 will see its debut. Compared with the current gen, it's taller and the hot staging ring looks a lot more similar to what we see on the Soviet designed rockets like Soyuz and the ill-fated N1. You can also see that the engines are a lot more exposed at the bottom of the Super Heavy. And that's thanks to Raptor 3 not requiring heat shields like Raptor 1 and 2 did. All of this, and the obvious, it's much taller than its predecessor. But then we saw the next next gen, Starship 3. This is definitely dividing a lot of folk in terms of its appearance. Certainly it doesn't look as sleek as Starship V1, but that's probably because it just looks so different compared to the previous two gens. I also think it's funny that the Starship looks to almost be the same length as the booster itself. Definitely a rocket only a mother could love. <laughs> Maybe it'll grow on us. The rest of the talk focused on SpaceX's long-term ambition of colonizing Mars, highlighting the need for a massive number of ships to be sent there to build out the infrastructure once every two years, which is when the Earth-Mars transfer window opens. Many ships would be scrapped for their raw materials once there, but as the base gets built out, more ships can start returning. Now, I'm skeptical that any of us will see a fully self-sustaining city on Mars in our lifetimes, even though Elon seems to think 20 years is a reasonable time frame to expect given that SpaceX estimates it'll require 1 million people to sustain, with millions of tons of payload transported from Earth to Mars. But that was pretty much the big thing that happened with Starship last week. I'm always mindful of Elon, often exaggerating expectations of timeframes and testing goals, but it is exciting to see what the future holds for Starship. In the meantime, Falcon 9 is soldiering on, performing a whopping four orbital flights last week alone. The first one was Starlink Group 7-18, which also happened to be the 190th Falcon 9 mission using flight-proven fairings. It launched from Vandenberg on the 2nd of April, and the first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, completing its 15th overall mission. The next Falcon 9 mission was on the 5th, this time it was another Starlink mission launching from the Cape, carrying 23 Starlinks to Shell 6. As the first stage touched down on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship after separation, it achieved the 275th landing of a Falcon 9 rocket, itself having landed a total of 14 times. The third Falcon 9 launch occurred back in California at sunset on the 7th of April, carrying 21 Starlink satellites to orbit, including six with direct-to-cell capabilities, as in ones that can communicate with mobile phones directly directly without the need for additional ground hardware, following the first successful demo of director cell texting earlier this year. Here's a shot of the satellites deploying, and you can see the six satellites at the top look a bit different. These are the ones with the director cell capability. Falcon 9's first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, completing its sixth overall flight. On the same day as that, SpaceX launched another Falcon 9, this time back at Cape Canaveral. This was dubbed the Bandwagon 1 mission, and was a small sat rideshare mission similar to their Transporter missions. This Bandwagon mission, though, was a bit different from Transporter. For starters, there were fewer satellites on board compared to a typical Transporter mission, just 11 for a variety of customers, and also the Bandwagon mission had a different destination. Rather than sun-synchronous orbit, it launched to a 45-degree mid-inclination orbit filling in the market gap for customers wanting to expand their coverage or complete more unique objectives in this less commonly utilized orbital inclination. The rocket's first stage landed on landing zone 1, completing its 14th launch and landing overall. 
The only other orbital launch last week came from China, taking place on the 3rd of April. This was a Long March 2D launch, which lifted off from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center in southwest China, carrying a single Yaogun 42 satellite to orbit. Not much else is really known about the payload, but it's generally pretty well understood that the Yaogun satellites are primarily used for Earth observation for military reconnaissance, as well as, purportedly, a few academic and civilian uses, according to official sources. But enough about things going to low Earth orbit, what about things returning from low Earth orbit? Specifically, the Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft, which undocked from the International Space Station last Saturday. On board were NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky, and Belarus spaceflight participant Marina Vasilevskaya, who all boarded the spacecraft and closed the hatch before departing from the station's RASFET module and returning to Earth, making a touchdown in a remote area near the town of Zezkazgan, Kazakhstan, and successfully disembarking. Lown Aerospace was back in action last Saturday, I decided to recreate one of the more interesting mission concepts turned into the annals of what could have been, NASA's big idea to send astronauts to Venus aboard a Saturn V rocket. If that sounds interesting to you, then statistically, hopefully, it should now be one of the cards visible on screen. You go ahead and click that. There's another video there from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully, it's a good pick. And if you want to help support my channel, you can join my Patreon or my YouTube channel membership scheme. Links below, just like the names on the left did. Massive thanks to all of you who did. I truly, truly appreciate it. But that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.